Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, my dear brothers and sisters. Uh, we would like to welcome you in your beautiful new show, The Ihsan Show. This show is a pre-show of uh, Laylatul Ihsan. So preparing for it and getting our soul ready. We know Laylatul Ihsan comes every year as an, our annual gala dinner for Noon Academy, for our beautiful community. Where in that night we get to connect our soul with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this inshallah Laylatul Ihsan will be coming in February. We are looking for all of you to come and join us and show us your support. So we have prepared these shows comes every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Make sure to be ready with your family at home and stay with us and watch us. We'll bring the beautiful knowledge to you, inshallah, that can soften your heart more and make you feel the love with the Creator. Looking forward to be with you every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Salaamu Alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala The Aashiq, the true and the sincere lover of God, the Almighty lives in this dunya in two different worlds the first world he been forced to live in by Allah and this world is the worldly life alam al hayat al dunya we called it the external world but there is another world is more private it's a very special world it designed by the ashiq himself within his own heart this is the world of ashiq made it for his beloved lord Allah the almighty in the external world the Ashiq sees things that he likes and dislikes. While in the internal world, the world of Al Ashiq, he sees only what he loves. But what is more important between these two worlds for the Ashiq, the world of Al Ashiq, his own internal world that he built and designed for his beloved Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this worldly life, we see two things exist. We see khair, we see shar, good and evil. But if we look deeper to see where these good and evil came from, actually they used to be inside the internal worlds of the human. So the shar, the evil you see on earth in this life, it was before it exist here, it was inside the human's heart, then came out. And the khair, the good you see in this worldly life, it was inside the human's heart, then it came out. What the Ashiq, what he does in this case, he takes from his internal world, the beauty of the world of Ashiq and his love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and purify the external worlds with it, feeds and support the external world with what's inside his own world. But in the meantime, he does not allow the external world to enter his internal world, the world of Al-Ashaq. Because he knows if that happens, then the external world will take the beauty of his internal world and will destroy it completely. In this life, there is a fact. And this fact is that the external world, the world of Al-Hayat al-Dunya, one day will come to the end then will vanish. While the internal world of the Ashaq will last forever. A day will come when this external world will end and everything was attached to it and built for it will end too. At that time people will know and will understand that every love they made in this life for the external world is ending and vanishing too. While the internal world of the Ashaq will not end. When the Ashaq separates his world with the external world, he leaves the external world behind his back. But he carries with him his internal world, the world of the Ashaq, in the next life to continue his journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one in this life understood the beautiful and true meaning of Tawheed of Allah, the oneness of Allah as Al-Ashiq, 
does. Because the Ashiq, he understood the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Then he emptied his heart completely from everything but Allah. He purifies himself. He works hard purifying his own nafs to make it the way how Allah loves it to be. He perfects his action for his beloved Lord, Allah. And every love he has for khair and good in this life is just a fruit of his great love for his beloved Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ashiq in this life does not hear but Allah, does not see but Allah, does not talk except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The worldly life, the external, the worldly life, the external world has lots of partners in it and everything. And people within this world are competing with each other towards everything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While the ashiq in his own world has only one, which is Allah. No partners in this world with Allah at all. Allah الذي لا إله إلا هو. This world, the internal world, is the world of peace, sakina, happiness, and comfort. In this, from this internal world, the world of al-ashq, the ashq takes all what he needs from strength and patience and support to help himself to live and deal with the external world every day. Allah subhanahu wa taala has given you an opportunity and a great chance to build your own internal world, the world of al-ashq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to live inside that world until your time comes to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This world is more beautiful than the external world. You will find in it everything you love and more. But in the external world, you don't find everything you love. In the external world, you have no power of changing it. You cannot control the external world because you live in it as a servant. But in the internal world, you are the master of it. There is a great connection between the two worlds. We mentioned the external world, the worlds of al-hayat al-dunya, and the internal world within the ashiq's hearts, the worlds of the ashiq, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is a great connection between these two worlds. And the external world is very important for the internal one. Without the external world, there will be no internal worlds, worlds of al-ashiq. From here we understand what is the main purpose and main job of the world of al hayat al-dunya, the external world. The main job of the external world is to introduce, introduce its creation to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ashiq from that world will be able to see his Lord through the creation. So that's why when you read the Quran and go through it surah after surah, you will see there's lots of ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his creation in the external world. Allah talks about the skies, Allah talks about the stars, oceans, mountains, earth, rivers, trees, fruits, many things. So all these exist in this life for one reason, 
they all speak in Allah's behalf. So the ashiq from this world will be able to communicate with the external world. Then he will see his beloved Lord through his creation. Then the external world will take the ashiq into his internal world. So will carry every beautiful things he saw there into his own world and makes it even more beautiful. Whoever did not taste the taste of al-ashq, of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will never be able to know himself. And the, know, and the one who cannot know himself will not be able to know his Lord. So you have and you must and everything around you in this life makes you love the Creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. So your body will live in this worldly life in the external world and deals with it. While your soul and your heart lives in the another, inside another world with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the world of al-ashq. The world of al-ashq, inside that world, you live with Allah and you are alive by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will take the life of all your desires and will give the life to your heart. All your desires will go, will vanish, will disappear, will die, will have no power to control you. And then Allah revives your heart. And the reason of that is your sincere love that you give to your beloved Lord. COVID-19 has impacted both individuals and businesses detrimentally. Noon Academy has also been affected with the loss of the ability to collect funds due to the closure of the masjid. In particular, the Ontario lockdown means that all Jumas are done virtually, resulting in no donations on Fridays. Noon cannot keep up with all of its operating expenses. Without community support, there is just no other way. With the center being closed due to COVID-19 and limited in capacity for most of 2020, donations have for the most part disappeared, falling into the unintended consequences of out of sight, out of mind. I want you to imagine coming out of this pandemic and there is no Noon Academy to take your family to. No Jumu'a Salah with Sheikh Khalid al-Maki. No community events where your children become more connected to the deen through lifelong friendships. Please visit our website and donate to the GoFundMe project at www.noonacademy.net. Our only ask at this point is to cover the masjid portion. Noon will not be able to operate unless we raise $30,000 between now and March. Jazakallah khairan for all your help. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Today, we will resume our introductory segment on the 17th century Ottoman traveler Evliya Chalabi. He was inspired by a special dream to embark on a journey across the Ottoman Empire and wrote extensively about his ad adventures in the Sa'at Hadname, or in English, the Book of Travels. We have spoken a lot in the past about travels as a government official, but today we will talk about his travels after his departure from political and military life. His last major posting was in 1648 where he was to serve Mustafa Pasha, the governor of Damascus, and he spent about a year there. From 1650 onwards, most of Evliya Chalibi's travels were on his own time. He visited the shrines of Iraq and he was able to perform his Hajj. He traveled to Russia within the borders of the Crimean Khan Mehmed IV and went as far south as Sudan and Mogadishu, Somalia. He even went to the Maghrib. But the information on his trip to Cyprus has been omitted from his book. Historians speculate that his father might have lived in Cyprus and in an attempt to visit him, he would be always attacked by European ships and there will be a point where he just gave up on ever visiting Cyprus. 
Outside of his writings, we are able to pinpoint exactly where Evdiya Chalabi has been. He used to leave behind a kind of Kilroy everywhere, and some of them can be found inscribed behind doors or on corners of walls, literally saying, I was here. He even had a ring that said World Traveler on it. It was a gift from the Patriarch of St. Catherine's, who also described him as an honorable man and a man of peace. It is hard to imagine, but it is not easy remembering every village that one passes in a day. And when on horseback, you are subject to all the world's weather with no refuge. You may not even feel comfortable to write down anything. It is not like he brought a desk with him everywhere. Even on his Hajj trip, he did not take the normal pilgrim route. He took an extreme detour just because he had not seen those areas. He truly lived by his maxim, travel, trade, pilgrimage. Professor Denkoff of the University of Chicago, a lifelong student of Avdiya Chalabi's work said, travel was not a diversion, but rather an obsession. He had to see everything and he had to record everything he saw. Evliya Chalabi did his Hajj when he was 60 years old. And when finishing his Hajj, he took a detour to Egypt because he always wanted to visit Cairo. On his way to Cairo, he saw people riding rhinoceroses. He visited the pyramids, even went inside. But he was scared of the crocodiles in the Nile though and was amused by the monkeys. There, in Cairo, the Amir took him on a tour and brought him to an old fort on top of a hill overlooking the capital. It was a beautiful sight, and he was in complete awe of the city. Similar to Ibn Jubair in the past, he saw the infrastructure, the madrasas, and the hospitals, and was greatly impressed. He said, in his own words, In short, there is no city in the entire world, let alone in the Ottoman Empire, that is such a sea of men and with such productive lands as this. Cairo is called the mother of the world because if while the world is suffering death and famine, Egypt can feed it. But if God forbid Cairo suffers a famine for a single day, not all the crops world can sustain it. For Cairo is a sea of men. In Cairo, flocks of animals, horses, and mules, camels, cows, water buffaloes, sheep, and goats roam about in the marketplace. And donkeys are so numerous that they have taken over the city. One can hardly pass through the streets because the donkey drivers are constantly shouting behind you, on your side, in front of you, on your right, on your left. Sometimes they pick out the naive Turks and cry, give way Effendi, and trample them with their donkeys. By this time, the previous full account of Cairo was written 200 years prior to Evliya Chalabi's account. It took him 40 years to write his book, and it finished in 1680. He retired from his travels at the ripe age of 80 years old. His words paint a picture of the lands he visited in a way perhaps better than any photograph or painting of today. He was highly spiritual, an intellectual, a gentleman, a soldier, a writer, an explorer, and a statesman and was excellent in all fields, except for cartography. He left very hard to read maps of his travels. No one knows for sure where he died, but many historians say he died in Cairo since his works were found there in the libraries. In contemporary times, there was a petition to rename a major bridge in Turkey after Evliya Çelebi. Petitioning the powers that be is something embedded in the Ottoman political culture. Today, people partake in an organized travel across Europe in his memory. This was done in 2011, during the 400th anniversary of Evliya Çelebi's birth, and was partly organized by Dr. Uh, Caroline Finkel. 
Her and some Turkish students literally traveled for six weeks on horseback, retracing some of Ev Evliya Shalabi's steps. This was also done to foster uh, a traveling culture and promote positive change within the youth of Turkey. Al Mutanabbi, the great Arab poet of the 10th century, said, The most exalted seat in the world is the saddle of a swift horse, and the best companion for all time is a book. Although this was 600 years before the birth of Evelia Chalabi, this poem encapsulates his life fittingly. Next time, inshallah, we will talk about another uh, historical figure in our history. And inshallah, we hope to continue this history segment and more. So make sure you subscribe and stay tuned.